A very good evening, friends, and welcome to the, six, the fifth in our series of six Lenten programs focused on transitions. We have had quieter variety and looking at the faces of those who are here for the first time this evening, I can see that Chief Cott has her fan club. <laughs> <laughs> Next Wednesday, we will have the Reverend Melissa Johnson, the newly elected president of the Eastern District of the Moravian Church. It's about time we have clergy at one of these Lenten <laughs> programs. It is my distinct honor to extend a warm welcome to Chief Cott and trust that she will feel at home in our presence here at Central Moravian Church. For the second time today in this room, <laughs> the reading of the Moravian Daily Text. It was read at 7.15 this morning by Dave Wickman, who treated those who came to breakfast. <laughs> Wednesday, March 13. Our God turns the curse into a blessing. Nehemiah 13, 2. Lead on, O King Eternal, till sin's fierce war shall cease, and holiness shall whisper the sweet amen of peace. For not with swords loud clashing, nor roll of stirring drums, but deeds of love and mercy, the heavenly kingdom comes. And the doctrinal text from 2 Corinthians 5 verse 19, God was reconciling the world to God's self in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And God has committed to us the message of reconciliation. All our days, O oh Jesus, hallowed unto you. May our lives be given in your service true. Let us all experience in the end of days your abiding presence and your loving grace. And the prayer for today. Blessed Jesus, we pray for change, real change, and true transformation of our hearts and of the world we work to build every day. May your loving purposes and your holy will be done as in heaven, so on earth and in our lives. Amen. Mm -hmm. Chief Cott is in her second year as Chief of Police of the Bethlehem Police Department and her 18th year as a member of the police, the Bethlehem Police Department. Born and raised in McAdoo, Pennsylvania, in the coal region of our Keystone State. She grew up an hour and 15 minutes from where we are gathered this evening. A graduate of the Sales University, she dipped her toe in the Lehigh Valley and never returned, never changed, never went away. <laughs> Chief Cott earned the Bachelor's of Arts degree in criminal justice in May 2004, do the math quickly, and was hired by the Bethlehem Police Department in July of that year, 2004. After four or five months at the Allentown Police Academy, she began patrol duty in November 2004. Chief Cott served as a patrol officer for five years, utilizing her time effectively by becoming a member of the Northampton County Drug Task Force and assisting the Bethlehem Police Department's Special Operations Unit in narcotic investigations and enforcement throughout the Lehigh Valley. She earned a master's of science degree 
in criminal justice from St. Joseph's University in 2010. We are deeply grateful that Chief Cott chose to make Bethlehem her home. She and her wife, Kristen, and their son, Noah, and their daughter, Ali, are wonderful to have in the neighborhood. Chief Cott sustained an injury during a 9-11 police versus fire softball game. <laughs> <laughs> this led her to one of her great passions, forensics. Her next assignment was to the department's crime scene unit as a detective in 2009. Her promotion to sergeant came in 2012 while still a member of the unit. Following a series of assignments and transfers, one due to a retirement, Chief Cott made it back to the crime scene unit as detective sergeant from 2013 to 2016. 2016 was a special year for Chief Cott, promoted to detective lieutenant and now in high level management, she was at accepted into California University of Pennsylvania's doctorate program in criminal justice, graduating with her doctorate in May 2019. Promoted to the rank of captain in 2018, Chief Cott was assigned to the department's professional standards division, a position she would hold until appointed chief of police in October 2020. Throughout her law enforcement career, ancillary duties and accolades include their instructor, 2008-2010, crisis negotiation team member, 2008-2015, crisis negotiation team leader, 2015 to 2020, certified crime scene analyst with the International Association of Identification, Certified Hostage Negotiator with the International Association of Hostage Negotiators. Recognition in Northampton County and Lehigh County as an expert witness in crime scene investigation and in friction ridge comparison. Brothers and sisters, friends, all I invite us to offer a warm welcome to Michelle. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, thank you, Bishop, for that, that warm welcome and introduction. It's truly a blessing to be here, and I could not think of a better reason to be here than your transitions, speaking engagements on Wednesday evenings during one of, not one of, the holiest time of the year during the Lenten season. It's interesting to have this invitation because transitions is what law enforcement in America is going through right now. And it's something that our department has been actively committed to going about doing. One of the the sayings that my officers hear me say over and over again is lead from the front. And I assure you that that is something that we are doing, especially in this transition to a law enforcement system based in community engagement, community service, procedural justice. So I could probably be up here for the next four weeks, but I'm sure everyone has <laughs> families and work obligations to get to. I tried the very best that I could to take a smattering of some of the amazing programs and initiatives that our department is currently working on right now and to share them with all of you and to give us enough time for you to ask any questions that is in your heart or on your mind. So I'll go through the presentation and then at the end, please feel free to, to ask away. Uh, I, I'm just 
honored to be here. And I, I really hope that I can share some of the, the amazing things that the men and women of the department are doing uh, with our community partners, with all of you. Slide, please. So something that we really honed in on when I was appointed to chief of police in October, 2020, was what ways can we better serve our community? Sometimes, regardless of what profession it is, whether it's law enforcement or healthcare, industry, sometimes <laughs> individuals receiving services feel like they're being spoken to and not heard enough. And that's something through my years of service with the Bethlehem Police Department, getting out into the community, talking to community members, people want to be heard. They don't want to be told what neighborhood problems they should focus on or worry about. They want to express their concerns to their government entities, whether it be law enforcement, streets department, their health bureau, or regular civic government. So our initiatives all stem from how can we best serve our community? Next slide, please. So one of the first things we wanted to accomplish is making sure that we have the proper structure in place to allow our officers the time and logistics to set up community engagement events that were going to succeed. When the murder of George Floyd occurred, you had a lot of individuals rushing out to get out in front of a mic and say, hey, look at what we're doing. We're, we're already doing this. We're, you know, look at how progressive we are. Look at how uh, professional and how much we subscribe to the community policing philosophy. But then when you ask them to explain community policing, they can't explain anything to you. Um, they don't even know where to start. I'm a really big proponent of taking your time and making sure the actions that you are going to implement are going to work, are sustainable, and that you're putting your people in a position to succeed. So looking at how our department was structured at the time, being that we're a quasi-military organization that has a chain of command, we needed to make it where we have individuals that are those specialists. I always use the, the healthcare analogy. Yes, you can go to the ER if you're not feeling well or you're injured, but if you need to follow up with something specific, uh, you need to see a cardiologist, an oncologist. You're going to go to that specialist. So we wanted to make it where our specialists in community engagement and community policing have the time and the resources to commit to engaging with our community members and setting up events. But also, all too often it seems in law enforcement where you, you have the same individuals that are always out at the community events. And it doesn't feel like the whole police organization subscribes to that community policing philosophy. So we wanted to be able to have the proper ranks in place where that community services lieutenant could reach out to a patrol lieutenant and set up, hey, we have an Easter egg event this Saturday. We're gonna have two of our community officers there, but we want two of our patrol officers there as well because we wanna make sure that we're getting officers from all different backgrounds, all different years of service engaged in community events. So, you know, we, we talk about transformational change. That's how that occurs. That's how you change subcultures and organizational um, culture and norms and values is by getting everyone involved and having them buy in. So in March, 2021, we did the reorganization and we created the support services division which consists of our, our specialists, 
We have our criminal investigations, detectives. We have our Bethlehem Housing Authority officers. We have our community services unit. We have the school resource officers and traffic officers. And again, having that alignment enables more individuals from the department the opportunity to get involved in community events. And I believe that was one of the first reorganizations in 20 years at the department. Uh, spoiler alert, law enforcement officers do not like change. <laughs> so, uh, it, it was a much needed change because we have to be about efficiency. We have to make it where our officers and our community partners can succeed. Next slide, please. Another initiative that we started that I'm very, very passionate about is our neighborhood outreach initiative. This initiative provides officers across the board, regardless of if you are a newer officer that's only been on two years to a 18 year officer, the opportunity to go out into neighborhoods and get out of a car. All too often, individuals don't wanna just walk up to an officer in a car to talk to them about things going on in their neighborhood or just to have a simple conversation. That, that, that car is a barrier. So having officers walk around on foot, having officers out on bicycle, on horseback, it's a great way for us to engage our community members and hear them out, talk to them about their concerns in the neighborhood. What would they like us to focus on? Um, but also, as we'll see in a subsequent slide, help them with issues that may not necessarily be law enforcement related, but improving that government bureaucratic workflow that all too, all too often people get confused or jumbled. Who do I call about this? Where do I get a permit? Being able to kind of streamline that for our residents was so incredibly important. Next slide, please. So here's just some information about where the program occurred. Because it was grant funded through a uh, CDBG, a uh, community development grant, it was designated to occur in locations of the city that were identified by the local economic development department as being low to moderate income. And we really tried to disperse our foot and bike shifts across the city. Um, sometimes people get very territorial. We only want you to be on the south side or we only want you on the north side. The city of Bethlehem is huge. Uh, so we wanna be able to, to make sure that we're providing services and outreach to all of our community members. So we really tried to evenly spread out these initiatives. Next slide, please. In addition to having officers out on bike, horseback, um, on foot, we had various events throughout the year. And what I really enjoy about these events is that the officer doesn't have to answer calls for service on the radio. There, there are patrol officers out to make sure that if there's an emergency, we are able to respond and help people. But at the same time, these officers that are put in situations day in, day out, where they have to respond and make split second decisions um, that may you know, suffer from time to time from that hypervigilance of one minute you're on a barking dog complaint, the next minute um, you're going to a very physical domestic. Uh, having them come to work and do nothing but have fun is so good for the soul and heart. And you should see the looks on people's faces. <laughs> Officers that initially are kind of hesitant. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't have kids. What am I supposed to do? Here's a basketball. Go play basketball with them. Talk to them. And they have the biggest smile on their face. And we saw so many officers uh, really, really trying to get repeat <laughs> opportunities at these events because they enjoyed themselves so much. 
So we had park days where people just came out to play basketball, kickball. Uh, we had a shred-a-thon event over at Fairview Park, which was very, very popular. Um, the, the truck that we had come in was filled within a matter of hours. It was amazing. Um, we did the Cops and Kids over at the Fowler Center, uh, which was phenomenal. We went out to the movies in the park where I'll touch on it a little bit, but we really started to hone in on our partnerships with other departments in the city of Bethlehem, like Parks and Recreation. Coffee and Conversations, the, uh, the Cops and Kids Trunk or Treat. Halloween was a big deal um, for our officers. It was the first year that we basically uh, got candy that was donated from Just Born and just put them out in neighborhoods and said, hey, all you need to do, is kids come up, hand out the candy, talk to everybody, help them cross the street, visibility. It, it was amazing. So these are just some of the programs that we were able to run. Yeah. And one of the concerns, especially coming off the heels of high profile uses of force by law enforcement, especially against marginalized members of society. There were individuals that were very hesitant about us being out in communities that thought, I know what this is. This is uh, another opportunity to say that you're going out to do some community engagement, but you're gonna go out and give people parking tickets and arrest people and, and have these heavy crackdowns. Uh, similar to you know, the weed and seed program, there's really, the, the meaning behind it was very, very good in the, the 90s and early 2000s, but a lot of people kind of utilized it to really come down hard on some neighborhoods. I'm very, very proud of the statistics that we have for April, 2021 to November, 2021, because we were able to show members of city council, members of our local government, members of the community that we weren't out there just trying to arrest people for things. Um, we were making referrals with our permitting uh, department, uh, our fire department, we were out there um, making citizen contacts in non-enforcement settings where you know, there, there isn't that call for service, there isn't that opportunity um, where somebody is, is gonna be arrested. There were definitely things that people came across. Uh, citizens you know, were complaining about, hey, I paid for this handicapped parking spot and this individual is parking there, they're not, they're not permitted to be there. So, you know, giving that parking ticket, but very, very proud of the numbers and the initiative and the meaning behind this. Next slide, please. So where's my, so this is something I'm, I'm also extremely proud about. We just did a presentation uh, at the social work conference out at Kutztown last Friday. Another thing that we recognize is there is this vicious, vicious cycle that occurs where individuals are not receiving the social services that they need. And that's resulting in repeat encounters with law enforcement. And when you look at some of the incidents that occurred over the past three years, where law enforcement had to use deadly force on some members of society, there were patterns where family members of those individuals, community members that were killed had reached out in the past for mental health services, community services, weren't receiving the help that they needed, that law enforcement had been at the house, had been involved with the family multiple times. That vicious cycle has to end. And we are very, very blessed to have our health bureau here. There are a lot of municipalities that don't have that luxury that have to rely either on a county agency or a multi-county agency. Director Wenrick has been a phenomenal partner and from the very beginning was arms wide open with, yes, we want to partner with you. Let's do this. Let's work on a social work liaison program. Let's integrate social work into the police department. So initially the pilot program began in November, 2020 to July, 2021. And it only consisted of one platoon 
we have four patrol platoons here in the city of Bethlehem. We wanted to start off small to identify our needs as we went along, ways to make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that the program was gonna succeed. And it initially started with just referrals. Officers would go out for calls for service. And when they were at a location, instead of just focusing on things that were overtly apparent, such as, hey, someone's suffering from substance abuse here. Uh, there's there's uh, domestic violence related issues here. Looking deeper, what are some of the social issues that may be contributing to what's occurring? Such as someone lose their job recently and that's causing stress, uh, putting food on the table, food insecurity, housing insecurity. Being able to, instead of sending down a nameless referral to our county agencies that do an amazing job, but are severely underfunded and overworked, not having that face-to-face -face warm handoff, we were struggling. And now being able to work hand-in-hand -hand with Ms. Jordan Westerman, our amazing master's level social worker from the city of Bethlehem Health Bureau. We were able to start the program off with 75 referrals, and we were very, very excited about that. Uh, but imagine our surprise and ex excitement when we opened the program up to the rest of the department and realized one social worker isn't going to cut it. Um, so from October 2021 to present, numbers consisting up until February 2022, we had 187 new referrals in just that five-month period. And even more so, it wasn't just about referring folks. It was about co-responding. And it wasn't just Ms. Westerman asking hey, I, you know, I really need to go out on these calls with the officers. I want to be there to help. I want to make sure we're providing services. Our officers were going up into the health bureau, interrupting their staff meetings <laughs> and asking her to come with them. That's huge. I, I can't even express how incredibly proud I am of our officers and, and what a testament that is to Ms. Westerman as well. Because again, Change scares people. And I think when there was a lot of talks on that national level for reform, people automatically assumed, let's get rid of the police. That's what they're talking about. And when you talk to our partners in social services, when you talk to our, our, our friends in the mental health system, that is not the case. It is us working together more, efficient, more efficiently, making sure that our community members have access to the services that they need, whether it be county, city, or community. Um, so up there on the chart is just a little bit of some of the things that we were getting referrals for. And it was across the board. And we really want to stress that there's that misconception that, oh, it just has to do with um, substance abuse or mental health. Uh, people are struggling. The pandemic has been extremely hard on individuals, especially, I don't have the slide up there, but one of the, the primary age groups that we're seeing a lack of services for is our, our 30 year olds, our 30 and 40 year olds. So just something to think about, but this, this program is expanding as we speak. It's something that um, I'm very proud of. We are very committed to and really looking to expand the program from where it was just Jordan to now we have uh, Miss Melendez that's helping out as well. She's another master's level social worker. And we have two um, interns from Kutztown University that are also in their master's social work program. Next slide, please. So I like to throw out that we're re-accredited. A lot of places, um, this may be lip service, but I, I like to kind of tout that we are committed to being accredited. And accredited means that we have to abide by national best practices and standards um, for not only 
local, the Pennsylvania accreditation agency, but also CALEA, that federal national level. Next slide, please. We have a new report management system. Uh, you may be asking, how does this have to do with transitions? Um, it, it has a lot actually. So before where people kind of ask questions, hey, why do I see so many officers in this location of the city? Why does the large majority of your uh, use of force reports occur in that part of the city? Why are you going out with your social worker to talk about various uh, substance abuse programs on my block? Well, now that technology has gotten so much better, we need to do more data-driven policing. We have to work smarter, not harder. And being able to utilize this new program that we received back in March, 2021, along with the rest of the law enforcement agencies in Lehigh County, this new report management system is going to enable us to take data and utilize that in our everyday operations. So that's an example of a heat map on where our calls for service occurred in 2021 in the city. And next slide, please. This is always fun because people uh, usually assume that the busiest times for calls for law enforcement are on the weekends, but um, you know, fun little data like that. So when we're planning, hey, how many officers do we need out tomorrow? How many officers do we need out this weekend? Um, where are our accidents occurring? Being able to work with our engineering department. Uh, one of the intersections I always use as an example is Linden and Market Street, right? Yes, yes. yes it's horrible. But being able to get that data and work with Tiffany, Miss Wells and being like, this, this is a problem and taking citizen concerns, we're able to show PennDOT the data to make actionable change occur. Um, and those are just uh, examples of the different types of polls that we go on. Next slide, please. So commitment to transparency. Uh, this, is, this is huge. This is something that we're actively working on right now. If you go to our city webpage, we do have our body-worn camera policy up as well as, well as our roster duty. Uh, directive, but we want to have all of our directives up that our community can go to and see what is the police policy on use of force? What is the police policy on body worn cameras, on, uh, you know, the domestic violence protocol that the, the city subscribes to? And then Act 180, there's a lot of legislation occurring in the state of Pennsylvania around policing and reform. And Act 180 passed, and it's gonna be a requirement that mandates all law enforcement agencies to report their use of force data to the state and have to report on a monthly basis. That becomes mandatory in 2023. Uh, my team, which is amazing, has that up and running already. So we are, we are well a year ahead of schedule um, because we really wanna show our community that we are trying, we wanna be as transparent as possible. Next slide, please. City partnerships. I mentioned it with our Parks and Recreation Department. One city department, one entity can't solve a whole city's problems, can't serve all of society's uh, issues. There has to be this partnership that ha there has to be this communication. And it, it's something that I've very, very much been patch passionate about is working with the other department heads and having our police department work together with them to provide professional high quality service to our residents. So whether it be working with our health bureau on uh, pedestrian safety events, working with the streets department during the crazy snowstorms that we had in January and February of 2021. Tropical storm Ida was very, very scary. We worked with fire and EMS and our streets department to help rescue stranded uh, motorists and individuals um, down by Saucon Park whose 
uh, houses were flooding. We also worked in unison with the health bureau with the, the various COVID-19 vaccination clinics. Next uh, slide, please. So in addition with the, the city departments, it's extremely important to work with your community partners as well. And as I mentioned, we have a great partnership with the Cops and Kids Reading Room over at the Fowler Center on the south side. Miss uh, Bev Bradley is an angel on earth. Uh, she is so passionate about helping children and providing them with the opportunity to take these books home, uh, providing them with the opportunity to, to make gifts for family members at various events. So it's something that we're very passionate about. Uh, working with our, our friends at the, the Hope Center over on East Broad Street with treatment trends. It, it is about time, folks, that we have a alcohol and, and drug treatment center here in the city through the county. Um, we are the largest municipality in the county, so I, I'm very happy that they're, they're there. Um, our PEER program enables individuals, if they want help, uh, to work on their way to substance abuse recovery, they can come to a police officer out on the street, they can come to the police department, or they can go directly to the, to the Hope Center and ask for help and a certified recovery specialist will assist them. Uh, a, a quick story about that is we had an officer assigned to the Bethlehem Housing Authority. A woman unsolicited came up to him and said, I, I'm, I, I'm ready to get clean, I wanna get clean, uh, can we go now? I, I'm scared if I wait till tomorrow, I'm going to change my mind. He gave her a ride over to the Hope Center and the Hope Center was able to, to help get her into a rehabilitation facility. So we want to see more of that. We, we don't want people to be scared to come to our officers when they want help. Uh, we, and we want to be able to reach out to the, those subject matter experts that are able to, to have that warm handoff and help our citizens. And then the United Way uh, Handle With Care program is fantastic. As a mom, kids are, are, they have a very special place in my heart and our, our children are exposed to so much and are all too often forgotten about. They're, they're the silent victims when they, they, a loved one passes away or they're involved in a car crash or they see um, family members fighting. So the Handle With Care program is an opportunity for our officers to reach out to our partners at the school district and just give them a simple Handle With Care. And no further information, no confidentiality is broken. Just handle that individual with care, give them some grace. If that student comes in and they're, they're irritable, something's bothered them, give them some leeway because they may have been up all night because a, a family member passed away or they were involved in an accident earlier that morning. So it, that's another fantastic problem, uh, program we're involved in. Next slide, please. Uh, our department has worked with the Walmart Distribution Center. All of the toys that we um, go to Good Shepherd and St. Luke's and uh, just hand out, out on the road to individuals out and about on our beautiful Main Street um, during the Christmas season. Uh, all those toys came from Walmart and that's through a, a fantastic partnership we have with them. The Pennsylvania State Police uh, have, have been great partners as well from one of the donations that they received. Trooper Seipel was able to reach out to our school resource officers and over at Pembroke Marvine um, at the Boys and Girls Club offer uh, brand new majestic jerseys from different sports teams to some of our local, local youth. <clears throat> and then working with our friends over at New Bethany with our Thanksgiving dinner that we have officers serve to our community members are, are just some examples of the community partnership that we're doing and engaging in. Next slide, please. So we participated in a number of events over this past year as well, uh, such as the Southside Spring Cleanup. We had the Girls on the Run events, which is a phenomenal program that our, our friends in the Bethel Mary School District are doing with young ladies. Uh, the Coalition for Appropriate Transportation. I love, love, love them. They're always inviting us to help out with their bike club. 
over at, uh, you know, William Penn Elementary, and then our NAACP Community Advisory Board Committee with letting us have, you know, sit at the table and hear our community's concerns, share information, if there's something happening on a national level, um, allowing us to, to have a seat at the table and, and be a, a partner um, have just been some of the fantastic programs that we were able to participate in. Next slide, please. And then we participated in things such as the Moore Miles tree toss to benefit turning point of the Lehigh Valley. Uh, we had officers from various units guest read at various Bethel Mary school district uh, schools, helped unload food deliveries at the Hispanic Center of the Lehigh Valley, and then participated in events at the Bethlehem Public Library. So again, if you want to change a culture, it's important to let everyone know what matters to you. When you prioritize things, people are going to start to prioritize it. And we're really, really trying to show that policing, I, I can't speak for every city or town um, in the country, but here in Bethlehem, community matters and service matters. It's so much more than just responding to calls for service. Next slide, please. Training, training is huge. Uh, and just some of the examples that we have done over the year are bike trainings. We want more officers out on bikes. Um, for that approachability. We have all of our officers not only going to the basic crisis intervention training that Northampton County and Miss Karen Yab does an amazing job, but we also want them going to that five-day certification for CIT training. And then we have our community partners come in, such as Turning Point, to give refresher training to our officers at roll call about Turning Point services how we can better serve our community. Next slide, please. After a two year hiatus, we had our Citizens Police Academy again. And the program again is another way to engage with our community members, to hear them out, have dialogue and show them a little bit more about the department than some people are, are kind of used to just you know, reading about, actually giving them that the hands-on interaction. Next slide, please. We were able to have our Junior Police Academy, which is a fantastic program open to Bethlehem uh, area school district middle school students. And they get to learn a little bit about everything, not only policing, but public safety in general and the criminal justice field. I mentioned CIT, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Sergeant Ryman, who was the Northampton County CIT Advisory Board Team Officer of the Year. So he does a fantastic job uh, on his own time. He is often down there volunteering, helping out um, on their board. Next slide, please. We also want to celebrate Officer Azoa, who was recognized for his hard work in keeping our, our roadways and highways safe. Um, so he received the Lehigh Valley BUI Highway Safety Task Force Award. Next slide, please. We got a new canine. Uh, so what was really important to me, it's important to recognize the past when you're going forward in the future. And when you, a lot of people think of police canines, they think of um, that German shepherd type dog and barking, and there, there's a lot of negative connotations that can be involved. We wanted to do something different. We wanted a dog that you can take out into public to have at community events that people can run up to and pet and not be scared, um, that the handler doesn't have to you know, be uh, cautious about interacting with people. So instead of asking for the, uh, the business standard, industry standard, German shepherd, uh, we went with the German short hair pointer. We looked at Labradors, Labradors, believe it or not, were, uh, yeah, spoiled rotten and just wanted to lay around and no disrespect to, to arson canine silver, but Bean is phenomenal. And she not only specializes in explosive detection, tracking lost individuals, but also that community engagement. Um, and her handler, Officer Burton, is phenomenal uh, if you ever have the chance to interact with him, he is a character. Uh, 
he often teases me that, you know, I, I love being more than I, I, I love our officers, um, <laughs> which is somewhat true. But, <laughs> yeah, she, she's very, very special. Uh, forensic equipment, again, with our partnerships, uh, Northampton County District Attorney help gave us funding to purchase a new crime light. Again, the forensics is important to me. Um, so something to kind of help out our forensic services unit that we not only utilize here in the city for crimes, but we can share with our other law enforcement colleagues across the, the Lehigh Valley in case they need those resources. And then finally, um, we're really proud of the, the restoration of the police memorial wall. It was damaged in 2019 by a drunk driver and kind of sat in disrepair because of uh, legal issues and, and insurance, you know, getting the, the proper funding put into place. But our, uh, our city masons did a phenomenal job repairing it and, and giving, you know, those officers that made the ultimate sacrifice, the, the due honor that they deserve. So that's a little bit about our department. Um, thank you so much. I, I'm sorry if I was long-winded. I, I get very passionate and excited uh, about the things that we have going on and I, I'm open to any and all questions. Yes, sir. Have you seen any transition in how new officers are recruited? Yes. I have personally, because one of the things I like to do, if, if I'm bringing you in, I always tell people that, you know, you have your family, your name family, but then you have your work family. And if we are bringing you into the family, it's on us to give you our expectations. It's not fair to hold people to standards when you don't tell them what the, the expectations are. So we make it very, very apparent what our department is about. And we let people know right from the get-go that, yes, we're going to go for calls for service, um, 911 calls, robberies in progress, but you're also going to be involved in the community. And if that's not something you're about, we are not the department for you. Um, because right, wrong, or indifferent, you have individuals that may see things in movies, video games, television shows where they think, hey, that's what policing is like in, in real life maybe in some other departments, but you gotta make sure it's a good fit for all parties involved. So recruiting, we really, really stress doing that hard work at the front end to vet and truly make sure that the person that you're bringing into the department, that you're bringing into the community is someone that, that belongs there. Um, you know, you're giving them the trust, this, this, uh, awe-inspiring authority, they, they need to be worthy of it. Yes? Are there other female officers? There are. So for the longest time, there was just one. And I got, I got spoiled. I thought I was going to be able to put like a love seat in the ladies' locker room, get like one of those fake like fireplaces, make it my lounge. <laughs> And then we hired two, and then we hired two more, and then we hired two more, and now we're we're at ten of us, and it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, myself, and then we have a, another female sergeant uh, that was recently promoted. We have an officer that is assigned over at Liberty High School that does an amazing job. We have a detective back in our forensic services unit. Uh, that, I mean, they all do phenomenal jobs. They're spread across the board from patrol to specialized units. So yes. Uh, go you first, sir. Um, I was, I'm a retired middle school teacher. And, um, I was teaching when the DARE program was. Yes. And I just thought it was such a wonderful program because the students at a middle school level are beginning to sort of evaluate their attitudes toward things. And mm -hmm. by having a police officer, not only in the classroom, but you got to know them, they were part of the community and they you know, greet each other on the way in. It was just a wonderful program and I didn't miss it. And 
Yes. I, yes. And again, it's, it's all too often. I, I know I'm speaking to the choir. A lot of times really good programs are either underfunded or completely done away with to move money elsewhere. Uh, but people don't look at the long-term effects and, and how it hurts and, and how it, you know, kind of puts us back. So it, it's something I, I'd love to see come back. And I know statistically the DARE program, uh, it's not considered as evidence-based as some other programming, but just having that day-to-day -day interaction, again, without enforcement and right. getting to know individuals, that's huge. That's huge, so. Yeah, they didn't think, not only got to know the, the, the students who can be more disciplined problems, but, you know. Right. They got to know everybody, and they were, they were really accepted as part of the community. Right. Yeah. I just find it interesting in this city where you have this enormous swelling of um, people coming in. Yes. You know, students returning, the summer fest. Um, just seems like those activities and those influx of people seem to go so smoothly. But it must be very demanding. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you how do you adapt with um... so they got a they got a little bit of a piece of it at, at the Halloween parade of me on my radio because the whole thing is like making it look nice and cool and everything's fine but I'm like running across the, the photo that you didn't see is me sprinting across Main Street to put up a barricade because one of the officers was running behind and uh, yeah it, we have an amazing team an amazing team and and having that team effort is huge because there's so much that goes in to an event, whether it be Music Fest, which is every year it seems to grow more and more. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, or even if it's just a day or a weekend event. So it, it's through communication and planning and really trying to make sure that you're prepared. Because unfortunately, sometimes it's not if, but when. And, you know, I, I never want to see the day where we have something happen, a major incident, but if it does happen, we need to be prepared for it. And, and that's why, you know, we, we put so much effort into preparing. And then when we are out, uh, I'm on the radio, we're checking on things, weather forecast, uh, just so much goes into it. But thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, great credit. Mm -hmm. I don't sleep during music fest. <laughs> um, right. You know, there's stuff going on now. Like I, I explained a little bit when I first got here, I've been up since like one o'clock oh, and I was out in my office working on things. So there's a lot of effort behind the, the scenes that go in to, uh, to really making sure that we're doing the best we can. So, yes, ma'am. You alluded to the fact that <clears throat> police officers don't like change. And so I was just wondering, you know, when you came on board as chief uh, and you made the changes that you felt were needed, was there a lot of pushback? And then how did you handle that? So there, I don't want everybody to think that it was rainbows and sunshine. There were some individuals that, uh, you know, retired. I had one specifically say to me like, hey, good luck. Uh, I'm going to retire. I'm, I, I can't get behind the direction you're going in. Honestly, better off that way. But the vast majority of our officers were so supportive. And I think a lot of that has to, to, to be from putting the work in, uh, practicing what you preach, making sure that you're out there. Um, so on a lot of events, I really want to make sure that our command staff from chief deputy and captain's lieutenants are out doing the work side by side. You should never ask your personnel to do something that you yourself wouldn't do. So I, I think that's incredibly important. And that gave me some equity from the bank to, you know, hey, I know this has changed. I know it's scary, but come with me. I promise you we're, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and, and, and again, that's a testament to our officers. Uh, I'm, I'm so grateful to, to lead them and, and to have their trust and support. 
Yes. Two Zoom questions. Ooh, okay. The first one, who's in charge of speed concerns on the Hill to Hill Bridge? <laughs> <laughs> so much money. <laughs> this, this individual has received a variety of answers. So speed control on the Hill to Hill Bridge. So 378 is technically a state route. However, Pennsylvania State Police give us authority to enforce vehicle code violations, criminal uh, charge violations that occur. So technically, Pennsylvania State Police or the Bethlehem Police, speed violations is an issue. So it's something there is legislation out in Harrisburg right now where there's a bill to allow municipal police departments to utilize radar, fixed radar. Um, and then the Pennsylvania State Police want to be able to utilize a uh, mobile radar where if they're driving on 22 and someone is flying past them at like 95, uh, they can definitively pull them over and say that they were going 95. Having us have radar will help because when we do speed enforcement, we don't have the radar guns like the Pennsylvania State Police. We have to utilize the lines that you often see um, on the road where everybody, myself included, breaks and you're like, looking <laughs> over your shoulder. And, um, but yes, we, yeah. So the, the short answer is Bethlehem Police and the State Police, there's more that goes into it. We're very, very aware of the issues on 378 in general and the Hill to Hill Bridge. This weekend, uh, it's the first weekend for the Cars and Coffee event over at the Steel Stacks. We're expecting there, if the weather's nice, to be about probably like 3,000 um, motorcycles, cars coming in. So a vast majority of the individuals coming in are great law-abiding citizens. And of course, you're going to have that small hand, you know, handful that want to do burnouts and, and drag race, but we are we are going to be out in full force um, to make sure that none of the, the shenanigans occur. So, all right, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the second question is, uh, please discuss, oh boy, there's a lot of questions here. <laughs> all right. Uh, please discuss planning and working with state and federal officers. Excellent program and comments. So with the state and federal officers, it's all about relationships, just like anything else. And as I mentioned, Trooper Seipel, he's been phenomenal with working with us. Um, there has to be that give and take. So if he has an event, we make sure that we help out however we can, um, whether it be donating bikes or having our school resource officers go out and participate to where we had our community day event over at Northeast, he was able to get the state police helicopter in to, to, for the, dem, the demo to have children come up and take pictures. So usually that falls on the police administration to reach out to our state partners. And then our federal partners, um, we're lucky to have officers that are attached to various federal agencies. For example, the DEA, the FBI, they're, they're referred to as task force officers, but they're able to help with information sharing, resources if we would need it. Um, it. It's a phenomenal way for everyone to be on the same page because gone are the days of the neighborhood specific crime. Um, the Lehigh Valley is such a metro area where People live in Bethlehem, but they work in Mukunji or, or uh, they travel daily to go to school in, in, in Easton. Um, so we all have to make sure that we're sharing information. That's so important. Yes. Someone online just made a comment uh, that they had participated in the Citizens Police Academy many years ago and found it very informative and they highly recommend it. Awesome. That's Mike Pragheimer, if you're wondering. <laughs> I guarantee, I, though I'm, I'm sure it was phenomenal, uh, you know, when they went, I, I know that Sergeant Blake Kuntz is running the program now and he does a phenomenal job. So any other? Yes. 
I do have a question that I I was a little uh, I, I was stunned that the all of the qualifications that you have and <laughs> wow yeah, is that typical of a police chief that they have a doctorate and that sort of thing? Uh, <laughs> it depends. It depends on what the agency, what the city is looking for, prioritizing. There are some police departments out there that will make it a prerequisite to even apply for you to have a master's level degree. Um, whereas there are others that they may not require that. So I, I have a really hard time just kind of sitting still. And I've always had this drive to try to be the best I could be. And when I grow up, I, I, wanna, I wanna teach. I, I wanna be a teacher. Uh, in all my free spare time, I teach uh, as an adjunct over at Northampton Community College, criminal justice courses. And when I retire from this job, I, I wanna, I want to teach. I, I think that's where another area for trains change and transition needs to occur is with our, our young folks in that college setting before they enter the criminal justice yeah. system. So I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Well, I think with all the programs you have developed would seem to have flowed from your education. Absolutely. Right? And so we're really lucky to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about. Crime. <laughs> um, you hear about Easton all the time, shootings, and Allentown all the time. Our neighbors to the west, yeah. And Reading is yes. back. Yeah. What about, I don't hear anything here in Bethlehem. What about Bethlehem? How is Bethlehem doing in that area? So when I first got hired here, everyone talked of the magic of the star. <laughs> <laughs> and at the beginning, I was like, oh, yeah, okay, sure. But I, I always tell people it's because of Star. Uh, it it kind of, you know, it, it, we, are, we are the Christmas city. We're, yeah. you know, the, the birthplace of our Lord and Savior. It's not geographically, but you know, <laughs> and, but honestly, it, it is because we prioritize the little things. I'm not speaking ill of any of my law enforcement brethren, mm -hmm. but there are some departments where if you would call for a barking dog complaint, the police department would tell you that's not a law enforcement issue. Call the zoning department the next day, call animal control the next day. There are some police departments where if you call for what some people consider to be a nonviolent crime, they're going to tell you, Send us, send us an email as to what's missing and, you know, we'll take the report over the phone or we'll, uh, you know, we'll take it from your email. We go out to everything, anything. Um, and if it's not a law enforcement issue, we'll, we'll tell you, um, we'll provide you with the resources and services that you can go to for that specific problem. But I think just being out in the community and prioritizing whether it's that neighbor dispute over someone saving a parking spot after they shoveled it out all day. <laughs> there are so many instances in the news of that very scenario turning violent yes. and an individual yeah. losing their life. So going out and addressing it from the start yeah. And and de-escalating that situation, coming up with um, some type of plan in place. Okay, you park over here. You park over here. Mm -hmm. You guys gotta live next to each other. That matters. It does. The little things matter. And I again, I'm not saying nobody else is doing it, but I know that's something that I believe affects our rates here. Is you know we really really focus on those little things, and when something does occur. It's that team approach. It makes us matter. Yeah. You know, it's a, it just makes us matter. And, that and that's what policing in, yeah. in a democratic society is. Yeah. So. Tom, I'll get to you next. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Um, we're practically neighbors to uh, headquarters here. Uh, you yes. mentioned partnerships with many different 
organizations, how how can a church community show support and and be supportive? Of <laughs> <laughs> well, you, this is a huge step. You include us. Ask us to come to events. Um, I, I know that you're all so welcoming and service oriented, and that that is exactly what we're about as well. Anytime you have events, please please invite us, and, and vice versa. You know, when we have events that are going to be going on, reaching out and being like, "Hey, we're gonna we're gonna do this community day event. Please join us, um, participate with us." Uh, I, I think that is a, an awesome way um, to, to work together and collaborate and, and just kind of, again, make the, the city better. Tom, what do you got for me? You, you discussed uh, partnerships, various partnerships, and you also mentioned law-abiding citizens. Mm -hmm. How is your relationship and how do you work with the two university police departments? because that could be tricky, I think. It can be. Um, but again, it comes down to those relationships and going and having meetings. Moravian recently hired a new chief, Chief Dillard, who is amazing. Um, I'm gonna be picking his brain uh, for something that I'm very passionate about is officer uh, health and wellness and resiliency. Um, I did my thesis on the impact of suicide prevention programs on the occurrence of suicide in law enforcement officers. And we, in July of last year, lost one of our, our best and brightest um, to his own hand. And it, Chief Dillard has done amazing work in New Jersey uh, with officer resiliency. So I'm really looking to, to kind of work with him and come up with something, a plan in place for our officers here. Um, and. Chief Schiffer, which he's not chief anymore. I think he's like public safety director. Um, you know, being a former Bethlehem chief and officer, working with him and Deputy Chief Houts, that's important. Making sure, but not only those administrators are communicating, but also our criminal investigations unit, working with their detectives. Um, because again, our unique geographic setup, you don't have these college campuses or kind of that are off on their own, um, like DeSales. Uh, you literally have Lehigh, which is all over the south side. You have Moravian, which is kind of one of the jewels of our north side. Um, so it's important to make sure that we all work together because it, they're members of our community too. Even if it's you know just for a semester or four years, we want everybody to be welcome, be safe. And, and be appreciated. Yes. Yeah, you, it was cool. The dog, uh, you got the, uh, the, the nice looking dog. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was really cool. So, this is not a silly question. This is a serious question I have. What about the hats that officers wear? They're, they're our tradition, traditionally. <laughs> Whereas, if it switched to a baseball cap style, that may have the same effect oh. as your nice dog has compared to the German Shepherd. I'm Ab just wondering about that. Absolutely, you and I wonder if there's an officer in mind that has been trying to go to ball caps. I wonder if he like <laughs> encouraged you to do this. Tom, if you're watching. <laughs> so, one of my, one of the things we're going to be starting a health and wellness committee that is made up of members of the police administration and then our fraternal order of police. And we're going to be working together. The officer resiliency component is one of it, but also health and wellness would be, um, you know, we're carrying all this weight around our waist. How is that affecting, you know, we got this big vest on, how is that affecting our back, our hips, yeah. our uniform setup? Uh, over the years, our uniforms have changed and a, a good amount of money has been spent on, okay, we're going from this hat to this hat to that hat and from this uniform to that uniform. I need to prior, as, as the chief of police, I need to prioritize where that money's going. And as I told my officers, I'm very much aware of those, those, 
those hats. I hate those hats. Um, but I, I can't at this time in good conscience devote that funds where which could be going towards um, like an e-bike or a new police car to you know spending a couple thousand, I mean over like 10 grand, uh, 15 grand on getting everybody new hats. Uh, because because of the whole quasi-military thing, you need summer hats and winter hats. And yeah. it's like, yeah. Um, but I, I agree that that's definitely something that is uh, that's on the table we're very much aware of. Uh, Rich asked the first question of the evening, and it was appropriate that he would ask the last question. <laughs> That's a big man. <laughs> I happen to know that Craig has a comment from someone who is on Zoom that he may want to share with our guest this evening. Uh -huh. Sure. Uh, the individual says, I appreciate the scope and depth of your leadership in Bethlehem and using proactive approaches. Oh, awesome. yeah. Yeah. We're thrilled to have you with us. This yes, evening. thank you so much. And for now you me. know why the chief of police is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> We're thrilled you're here. Thank you. Uh, so on Sunday, we talked a little bit about Luke's fam famous story, The Prodigal Son. And we stretched the limits of time as it went for a while. Can I take you back there? Sure. Mm -hmm. So in the middle of the story is verse 20, Luke 15, verse 20. This is the point in the story where the young man decides to return home. And the verse says, but when he was still far off, his father saw him and was Filled with compassion, he ran and put his hand around him and kissed him. Yuck! <laughs> he had been feeding pigs. <laughs> he had been eating the food of pigs. <laughs> and he came go have a shower <laughs> with the garden hose first <laughs> and then let's hug. This is what Brene Brown says. She wrote a book about five years ago entitled Braving the Wilderness. This is what she wrote. People are hard to hate close up, move in. I think much of what you had to share with us this evening centered around a transition towards moving in. People are hard to hit close up, move in. Please pray with me. Thank you for our time together, gracious God, for the fellowship, for the joy, for the laughter, for the new information, and for the opportunity, the privilege to welcome a guest in our midst, someone who has dedicated her life to serving our community. Thank you for her. We ask your blessing on her and those with whom she works. We ask your blessing on each individual bowing in your presence now, and the homes and the families and the communities we represent. And so as we make our way home, safe travel, a peaceful night's rest, and God willing, as we open our eyes to a new day, may we see opportunities to pull others in, and share your love with our world. Amen. Amen. I wish you all a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very good.